Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're going to give it a couple more minutes. We had a nice RSVP list to our first death side chat with Dr. Manning. So just want to make sure everyone has an opportunity to join. I know it's homework and dinner time for many people after school activities. So we're just going to give it a couple more minutes and then we will get started. Thank you. Okay, I think we can get started. Uh, welcome everybody uh, to our first desk side chat with Dr. Manning. My name is Lisa Mindell and I am here with my co-president, Natalie Mason. Uh, tonight's event is hosted by the Harbor Fields Council of PTAs. Um, so we're so happy to, to do this. We're kicking off 2021 um, with this exciting chat. Uh, many of you may know that we've done these in the past as conversations with the superintendent. And now that we welcome our new interim superintendent, Dr. Rory Manning, uh, we did a little bit of rebranding and we know everyone's home or wherever you are, um, you know, we're virtual. So we're just going to consider this a little chat tonight. That's side, Dr. Manning's obviously at his desk. Um, and he is joined with us tonight with his cabinet. So we have Sharon Donnelly, Assistant Superintendent for Business, uh, Kelly Fallon, welcome back, Interim Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum, Instruction and Administration. Hello. And <laughs> welcome. And Maureen Rayner, Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources and Instructional Services. And yes, I had to write all of that down. The mouthful. Anyway, um, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background on the structure of tonight's event, you know, we used to be able to do these in person. Uh, we would have parents and caregivers, some teachers, members of administration and the Board of Ed join us and able to ask questions. Uh, this time for this first virtual event that we're doing, we did ask each of the PTA units, um, SEPTA, Harbor Fields High School, PTSA, uh, OMS PTA, TJL PTA, and Washington Drive PTA to provide us with some questions, um, both district focused as well as specific to their buildings. So what we'll do is we will ask these questions to Dr. Manning and you know he will provide responses. We will have another one lined up uh, for March 2nd and that will be a morning event um, so the structure may change a little. We'll, of course, want to hear from, you know, our members of PTA to please send in, submit questions for us, uh, just so we can make sure that we have various topics and, and answer the questions that are important to our community. Um, so we want to, of course, you know, just reiterate that this is tonight's event hosted by Harbor Fields Council of PTA. So that includes all of our units, and we're very thankful for them. So I will quickly kick it over to Natalie. Uh, before we welcome Dr. Manning. Thanks, Lisa. And just to reiterate, thanks to everybody who tuned in tonight. Take your time out of your evening to participate in our programs and to uh, be contributing members of your PTAs and our school district is uh, truly valued. And especially we're thankful for all of our PTA board members for helping us to put this program on and for all of their time that they've invested in um, the reopening task force, the diversity task force, health and wellness. There's a lot of uh, work that's been going on and we just are thankful to each of our unit board members for their uh, support and for their uh, continued participation and uh, leadership. So uh, it's not too late, join your PTAs in each of your buildings too. 
uh, they're working hard for you. So if you could uh, support them back, that would be great. I think that's uh, all for now. Good luck. Dr. Manning, we'll hand it over to you. All right, thank you and welcome everybody. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, my cabinet for being here and being supportive, uh, always there for me. And uh, I know that, um, you know, there's a lot of work that goes into what we do every day. And the people that you see on the screen here are uh, certainly responsible for, you know, trying to do everything and, and make everything work. And uh, I can't thank them enough for their, for their service to, to our community. I also wanna thank our, you know, the PTA council. Um, and, and all of our units. Uh, I, I know originally this was built as an OMS conversations with the superintendent. I appreciate the OMS PTA's uh, willingness to allow us to rebrand this as a district-wide event for my introduction. Um, and you know I do appreciate that. I'm so proud to serve as the superintendent of schools for Harbor Fields. As I said, you know this month uh, at our board meeting, if you got a chance to see it, uh, I consider it an opportunity, uh, one of the greatest honors in my life. Um, so I really do um, take great pride in, in this, uh, this opportunity, and I'm so thankful to be able to represent such a fine community, fine district. Um, it's important that everybody gets to know me a little bit. I, so I, I hope that you had an opportunity to see, um, you know, a message that I provided to the district or a board meeting that I presented at. But if you don't know me, um, I've been with the district uh, over eight years now, I'm in my ninth year. And uh, I've had nothing but great experiences. So that was a high school principal, moved up to district office. And um, you know, I remember my days as a high school principal and having that very strong relationship with the PTA because they do fabulous work. So you know, as Natalie said, if you can support the PTA with membership, every dollar goes to kids. And that's what's so important about the work that they do. Uh, so I'm so thankful to work with the fabulous PTA and all the different units that support um, support our students. And I'm, I'm really thankful this, for this opportunity uh, because this desk side chat is a great opportunity for uh, our residents to get to hear from me and um, about some you know, really important issues. So I'm, I'm thankful for those that are able to tune in. I know everybody's so busy and I do appreciate your time. So that's, uh, that's it for me. I'll go back to the questions. Great, okay, thank you. So we will kick this off. Um, the first question, uh, now that you are in the role of interim superintendent, how will the direction of the district change for the administration? Are there any new objectives or plans? Yeah, so, um, you know, when you have a transition, a superintendency transition, um, you know, that's a, that's a tough question, right? Because there's a lot of things that, you know, an incoming superintendent can try to address and change complicate that with a mid-year transition, it becomes a little bit more complicated. And then, you know, we're dealing with several issues such as the state budget crisis uh, and of course the pandemic that we're in. So this question is a little complicated um, to answer, you know, in a, in a normal year, never mind the year we're experiencing. But obviously it's very early in my tendency to talk about major changes and shifts, but we have a long way to go. Um, in the current pandemic that we're in. As you know, we're putting every resource in support, supporting our students and our staff, keeping our schools open. Um, and we're also entering the a budget season, right? So you saw if you were attending the last board meeting, Ms. Donnelly gave a fabulous presentation, the first opening presentation for the budget and development process for the 21-22 school budget. Um, and there's a lot of work ahead. So I would encourage the community to visit our website um, visit the Board of Education meetings. Uh, you can view them, they're all virtual now, and opportunities to stay current on that information. Uh, but to get back to the question, I guess the way I would approach this question is to talk about me as, as a leader. I'm a big proponent of strategic planning, long-term planning. Um, so, you know, ultimately I would love to see us enter a strategic planning operation, uh, looking at all facets of what we do from finance to curriculum, staffing, school security, diversity, equity, inclusion, and the list goes on. Um, we set goals in all those areas and we set goals for long-term success. And that way we're able to prioritize um, our needs and look at how we can fund those over the long-term. Um, but we know from experience that priorities may shift. So I'll, I'll set an example. 
five years ago, I came up to district office. And in my first year, we worked as a team to develop a five-year technology plan that was implemented. And that we implemented that plan knowing that we had to budget for everything. We had to provide staff development. We had to provide all the pieces. So we had that plan in place. Take fast forward now to 2020 and pandemic hits, right? A global pandemic hits. So you would think that that would take your priorities and basically throw everything out the window. But what it allowed our strategic planning in the area of technology allowed us to do was to shift priorities, not start over. And so we were able to reallocate a lot of the resources we had to make the current model that we have work. And it worked well. So we were able to take devices, reprioritize them, shift them around, and be able to, for example, provide a one-to-one -one device for every child in six to 12. So when we went hybrid, we were able to support that. We were also able to provide devices for students in grades K to five that didn't have one at home. We were also able to provide a device for K to five students that were on a pure remote instruction. Um, and then more recently with the order finally coming in, now we're able to provide devices for those students in school. So again, I just use that as an example. Um, what you would see from, from my administration is the opportunity for us to really look at some long-term planning, um, set our priorities according to the vision and mission of the district. Uh, if, you, if you know the district set a mission statement out last year, um, using the vision and mission as our focus in setting our goals, both near-term and long-term, and then prioritizing those things within the annual budget um, to, to make sure that we, we stay focused on, on, on what our community needs and the, you know, the design of the schools that our community wants. So that's, that's how we, uh, you know, that's my, my kind of roundabout answer to this question. In the near term, you know, we're also looking to, as, as you may have seen in our, um, in our board meetings, and through like the superintendent's report, we're looking at ways to spotlight students and make sure we keep a focus on what our students are doing and highlighting the great work that they're involved in. Uh, I believe that, you know, I'm a, a firm believer in telling our own story. And I feel like we have to find ways to do that creatively. So you'll notice on the superintendent's report and the board of education meetings, I include a stu uh, superintendent spotlight where we highlight certain aspects of, you know, what our students are doing each way. We provide a video or uh, maybe recognize them in the Board of Education report. But we really want to highlight the, uh, the great work of our students and staff. So those are some quick answers to that, to that question. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, so for the next question, um, what is the Harborfields Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force working on? And what are their goals for the 2020-2021 school year? Okay, thank you. Um, you know, one thing I was excited about with this format, and I hope you don't mind me doing this, but uh, since everything's virtual, I might as well take advantage of the opportunity for me to, if you don't mind, share my screen. I want to be able to show uh, some, some places that the, uh, the community can be able to access our, um, yep, access our, our website. Uh, so I'm going to... Uh, Pull up, uh, I thought I had it up already, but I don't. So you can see my screen. So what, uh, if you go on the district tab of our website, you will see the diversity, equity, inclusion uh, page of our website. And on this page, the community can find information about the task force and certainly look at the letter that we recently sent to the community, which lists all the members. And then we have the three different working groups. So to answer your question, um, the diversity, equity, inclusion task force is made up of staff members, community members, alumni, um, and we have you know board members on represented on here, and administrators. And what each of the working groups are currently working on is, is this some overlap, but they do have their own unique goals. So within each of the, uh, we have three working groups going on. We have the community engagement group. And they're obviously involved and engaged in the community and the work that's being done in our schools. So we have a lot of DEI work that's going on in our schools. And we want to make certain that the community is engaged in that work. The discussions around the dinner table at home are just as important as the discussions that are happening in our schools. 
Uh, and we want the community to be aware of that. We, we, we want to make sure that, um, you know, in order to institute lasting change, we need those conversations to happen. So engaging the community is really important to us. And that's why that, that working group is, is, currently, uh, is currently together. So they're working on uh, community events. And certainly there's more to come on that um, as we put together an event for the community to, to come together, understand the work that's being done and initiate some great, great conversations. So more to come on that piece. The staff development group is working together uh, to lay out a strategy for supporting our staff, both in the near term and long term. Uh, as I said, there's a lot of overlap between these working groups. So the staff development that needs to happen is currently also in the area of curriculum development, which is that overlap, but also in the area of implicit bias training uh, that will happen uh, with our staff. So this group is working to strategically map that out for us um, so that we can, we can make sure that's a priority for us going forward. And then of course we have the curriculum instruction group. So um, you might have seen at the last board meeting that there was a presentation that was done uh, on a board goal related to DEI. So if I can pull this up for a second, this was a, as a link to the actual presentation. And if you wanna see the video of that, that's on the Board of Education page where you can actually look at the, uh, and watch the video presentation, which I would encourage you to do. Our staff were involved in this and they did a great job. But this update was basically on this curriculum goal. And as you see in reading the goal, one of the goals that board set forth was to analyze and adapt curriculum and instruction programs and extracurricular activities to ensure cultural responsiveness and equity and equity in alignment with the diversity, equity, and inclusion task force. So that was the goal. So this rest of this presentation, I won't go through the whole thing with you, but it focuses on that goal. So that link is there. So as we do more and more, we're gonna put information on this website uh, for the community to come to and see and provide regular updates. In addition, we will provide updates to the community through our Connect Ed system um, and other means. Um, so it, that's, one thing in the area of curriculum instruction, but the others of course are working to provide our staff with resources so that when they do curriculum development process, progress, I'm sorry, projects, uh, they're able to use those resources and include diverse texts, include texts with diverse uh, perspectives and diverse characters uh, to make sure that all of our groups are, are certainly represented. Um, you know, a great idea that was recently shared with us uh, was to create a partnership with the public, par, uh, excuse me, Harborfield's Public Library and create a K-12 literature list of texts celebrating diversity and inclusion. So I'm pleased to share that this list is being developed currently and will be available by mid-February and publicized on our district website and our library website. So I have to thank Ms. Fallon, who's on this call with us tonight, and her leadership in the Curriculum Working Group uh, of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force for making this happen and putting this together so quickly. So again, that's something that's another immediate resource that we will have published here uh, and other locations within, within our website and also on the Harvard Fields Public Library website. So that's, that's to come very shortly. Uh, but again, I would just encourage the community to come in and, and view this website from time to time um, because it's rich with resources. There's also a list of different programs that we have going on in the school. And uh, you know you can read through all of it uh, at that time. So that, in a nutshell, is our DEI committee, our task force, what we're doing. It's a, it's wonderful work, challenging work, um, and I'm so proud to work with the with everybody on the committee because they're they're fully invested in in making this success, successful initiative for our district. Great, thank you. <clears throat> okay, the next question is a two part. Questions. So what I'll do is I will ask both and then Dr. Manning and I can reiterate the first one again, but they really tie into each other. These are great. This focuses on the mental and emotional health of all of our students. Um, so the first question is, in addition to providing school counseling as needed and having initiatives like Mindfulness Mondays, are there more robust plans the district has or is working to put in place to ensure that children who may be struggling mentally or emotionally are identified and supported? That's the first question. Yep. And following up to that, will this include collaboration between parents and caregivers, community members, 
and the district to ensure the well being of our students, especially given that many parents and caregivers are currently balancing working from home, remote learning, hybrid learning, et cetera. So, this is a really, really important question. I'm really so happy that it was asked um, because it's something that is truly very important. As I said, um, you know, I have three children of my own, three boys, and they would kill me if I ever talked. They found out I was talking about them. But, you know, they're, they're three different kids. They might as well have different parents. They're so different from each other, right? And they all react differently to different things. So I know from my own experience that, you know, what they're experiencing with whether it be hybrid education or the social isolation from friends, um, even family, right? That affects everybody differently. So I, you know, it's something that's obviously very important to us. And we know that a lot of the work that we're going through right now is extremely very difficult um, and it's challenging. But we also know that when we get these students back that you know there's a lot of work that we need to do as well. So, D, uh, so you know, this SEL piece is extremely important to us. It's, it's much a focus right now um, for us. And so it's, I go back to the fact that this is a really important question. And again, I am glad it's asked. So I just want to, if you don't mind, uh, go back to sharing my screen once more because I do want to show a, a resource that we have in place that um, you know, the community can at any point see. So if I go to our curriculum instruction page, there's some district plans over here. And this is a, uh, what used to be called the guidance plan is now called the Comprehensive Developmental School Counseling Plan. Um, something that New York State came up with as far as a name, but it's, it's basically the same thing. And in this, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but in this uh, plan, it goes through the goals that we have set forth for each grade band, K to five, six to eight, nine to 12, and then the various programs that are listed within there. So it's a really important document for us as a district, but also for our parents to have. So I'm gonna scroll down a bit. And so you see like within each grade band, and again, I'm not gonna read this for you. It goes through the goal and then it goes through the different programs that we have in place for that. So again, I, I'm not gonna read the whole thing to you, but um, everything that we do related to SEL is in here. And then on top of that, we also do an analysis through, uh, you know, data collection and, and assessment to review each program, make sure that it is, you know, appropriate, it's achieving the goals we set forth, and we do an evaluation, and in the following year's plan, those programs can be modified or not. You know, it depends on the outcome of that analysis. So that's something that we currently have in place. I wanted to reassure the community that we do have several and again, it's a, it's a very lengthy document, but we have several of these programs in place. To answer the question shortly, and I'm gonna stop sharing this and just go back to the question, we do have, and each building does this, where they do have their processes of these check-in meetings, where they work with teachers, counselors, um, and, and they conduct these regular meetings on students. And especially now in the time of the pandemic, where we, it's, you know, might not have access to all the students all the time, uh, we conduct these regular check-in meetings. And the idea of it is to try to identify, as the question asked, those students that are struggling, both academically and socially, emotionally. Uh, and when we do identify those students, the programs that we went through in that, in that plan are put in place to make sure that those students are supported. What I will say and this is, I'm taking off the superintendent hat for a second and putting on the dad hat for a second, is that the greatest outcome that I've seen in dealing with students that are struggling is in that partnership that we have with the home, school home partnership. Because certainly we, we might not, you know, there, there might be times when students are struggling but may not display that clearly for our staff to see. And the parents might, might see that uh, and work with their children, but not necessarily know how. So what we encourage parents to do is certainly to reach out to us to provide that input so that we can then follow up on that. Um, and then we, you know, our staff is great at making recommendations. So if it's something that, you know, we can handle with an in-house program and things that we can do, certainly that's what will be put in place. If there are things that we can do to work, you know, there might be recommendation that there might be some follow-up that's needed. 
Um, there are cases where if the student is, is really struggling that we can't provide that, that counseling support, we would recommend perhaps outside counseling support. And in that case, what, what I've seen work really well is when, if there is outside counseling, that our counselor connects with the outside counselor and work together in tandem to provide strategies for supporting students both in school and at home and then provide parent support uh, with those strategies and, and working as a team, a true team to address any concerns that I have. And that's obviously a little more extreme case, but it's something that has worked very well in those cases where students do need additional support beyond um, counseling that can be provided in school and emotional support that can be provided in school. Um, but I, you know, that partnership is really key. I also, while I was sharing, I forgot to mention one great resource. And this is again, me speaking as a dad. Um, if I go back to our curriculum instruction page of our website, we recently hosted some parent empowerment programs. And these are all on the curriculum instruction page. And I would recommend uh, for parents to take a look at these videos that were provided earlier in the year where our school psychologists got together and they provided two talks. Um, and I, again, you know, I've been an educator for my 25th year, like a long time. I learned so much from these talks. I went home and I made my wife watch it with me again uh, because it spoke to some of the struggles that students may experience and even adults in periods of isolation. You know, when you're, when you're quarantining or you're, you're trying to, you know, keep your family safe. Um, and the, the psychologist did such a great job in those videos of providing tips and tools and signs to look for and all these great things. So these videos here on the SEL support, um, I, would, I would recommend strongly that our parents, if you haven't seen those already, take a look at those. Uh, you'll quickly find yourself lost in the video and uh, you know, it'll go by quickly, but the, they're, uh, they're great videos, great resources. In addition to that, we did provide, and we are currently providing some additional parent support uh, and these are in the areas of instructional technology. So for parents, you know, how to navigate your Google Classroom, how to on uh, remote days, you know, motivate your child to, to participate, make sure that they have a good learning environment. So there's a lot of good um, videos and tutorials in here as well. Uh, but it, beyond that, we're more than just a website. If, I would hope that if parents have true needs in the area of SEL um, support that they've identified with their children, that they contact the schools, and work in partnership to address any concerns they may have. Um, and that's, you know, that, that again, that's the model I found to be so, so much, uh, so successful in the past. So the second question, I remembered it because I wrote it down. The second question was collaborative effort. I, I believe I addressed that question, right? So um, we always work in collaboration with our, with our parents. Um, the homeschool connection to Harvard Fields, I think is what makes us great. And I think it's something of point of pride for us. And so that, that collaboration is key and I would strongly encourage that. So, um, you know, this is something that we, we pride ourselves on. So I would definitely encourage parents to make sure that they are bringing concerns that they may have to the schools uh, so that we can work with, with your children. Thank you, that's great advice. Love that you have all the resources there on the website and are also always ready for a call. Yes. Um, our next question. Uh, so as a follow-up to the micro cluster strategy survey uh, regarding in-school COVID testing, are there any updates that you can share with the community? Yeah, so with the micro cluster strategy was put out in the late fall by the governor um, and it dictated a series of metrics that if the local area passed those metrics, we could be designated in a certain zone. So the metrics might be at a positivity rate. Later on, um, hospitalization was added, availability of beds was added. Uh, I believe at one point ICU capacity. So there was a lot of different things and it was constantly shifting. Um, so, you know, more recently, more toward the holiday recess, we did see some of those numbers start to creep up in our area near that. Um, and so a lot of superintendents became concerned and, and we're, we're discussing this. Um, and the word from the governor's office, but not official, 
was that the governor is moving away from the microcluster strategy. Um, I won't say that it was abandoned, but I think the emphasis was on keeping schools, you know, open because uh, they know, you know, they know that that schools are safe and our students are being successful, and and so um, that idea hasn't come. We haven't been designated as a yellow zone, as you know, and certainly our numbers in our area are down from where they were. So I don't anticipate that we would be designated in the yellow zone. Um, as P anybody who's been watching the Board of Education meetings know, we are prepared uh, for that if it does happen, but um, I'm pleased in a sense that we weren't designated in a, in a yellow, orange, or red zone, forcing either mandated testing or school closure uh, during that period of time. So not much to update in, in, in that specific um, you know, question of regarding uh, the microcluster strategy, but um, certainly if something changes, we would be letting the community know as soon as we know anything associated with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the next question, you touched upon this a little bit with our two-part question about emotional and, and mental health, but um, are there any plans or efforts underway for the district to support our secondary special education students and staff in the remaining months of the year to improve attendance and promote active learning with the hybrid model? Yeah, so um, this is again something that, you know, that, that basic mantra I was talking about last time about the partnership. Um, on our website, I'm not going to share my screen, but on our website, we do have the uh, the uh, chain of communication document, where if a parent is experiencing any issues, obviously contacting the school, but also contacting the PPS office, uh, because at any time, if there's a special education student, the, the department can revisit the uh, and provide you know whatever supports are needed. Uh, you know the, there are challenges with the hybrid environment, but there are opportunities for us to provide parent support um, to help our special education students remain engaged um, and, and active. And certainly if there's attendance issues, that's something that we would uh, be able to identify internally uh, and be able to contact the families and work with the families to make sure the children are attending uh, school, whether you know on their hybrid days remotely or in-person days. Um, so, you know, that's something that we would, we would certainly want to know and we want to form that partnership and make sure that that constant communication is there. But in that chain of communication document also, it does accelerate, right? So if parents do feel that they're not getting support in certain areas, there's opportunities to, to bring that uh, issue or concern uh, up the chain, so to speak, uh, so that to make sure it's getting addressed. Um, certainly we would want to know those things and be able to intervene if necessary to provide support for our, for our families. Great, thank you. Um, so some teams have recently been permitted by New York State to begin practicing and playing. Are there guidelines that coaches can follow so other high risk sport, uh, sports can practice also? Right, so you may have heard uh, if you've been listening for the past uh, couple of days that the determination was made uh, to allow high risk sports to begin. So if it's okay, I'd like to just provide a little bit of history um, back some time ago when you know, the decision was made to, to not allow high-risk sports and high-risk sports were identified, the uh, decision was made by the state. And there were some calls that we received regarding that. And could we decide on our own to go in a different direction? And of course we couldn't. So um, if the, the, on the last board meeting, we had put together an opportunity to to create, we had created before that, we had created an intramural program with our weight room to provide some conditioning. So that student athletes or students, all, any student could participate in um, conditioning, weight training um, as a way to allow some activity. Then at the last board meeting, we put together, um, discussed the putting together an intramural program, not knowing that within the next day or so, the governor would come out and say that high risk sports could go forward, but put the onus of that on the county level. So basically the Suffolk County Department of Health had to meet certain criteria to allow 
sports to happen. And then the, the county executive recently announced that those things, we could move forward. So I'm pleased to report that uh, high-risk sports for this particular season, boys and girls basketball, uh, uh, cheer, and uh, the other one is escaping me right now, but those are gonna be able to, to start um, this coming week. Uh, so we are in the process of making that happen and uh, putting that together. The, uh, the, the caveat with that is that it's mandated that any athlete participating has to participate in weekly testing. So there's going to be uh, a testing program that's put in place for our athletes and our coaches um, that would have to get tested weekly. And that doesn't have to begin until February 8th, I believe is the date. Uh, so they, we can start the season, but by February 8th, we have to have that, that testing program in place. So that will be something that we are actively working on and putting that together and making sure that we have uh, every all the safety protocols in place. Um, obviously, the coaches um, and our director of athletics are very concerned about the safety of our students. So we'll have all the you know the safety protocols in place to make sure that our students are as safe as possible um, and that they are able to uh, you know participate and have a great season and do wonderful things on the field and you know make us proud as they always do. And we're, we're looking forward to it. We certainly are, but we obviously want to make sure that our students uh, and staff are safe at all times. Okay. Great. The other Thank sport you. was wrestling. Yes. I don't know why I couldn't. <laughs> and and if, if parents have any questions uh, regarding the timeline, would it make sense for them to follow up with the individual coaches? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yep. There's certainly more that's going to be coming out. This was something that we literally found out about this happened. Yep. And so the, the guidance came out and I wish, I don't really care if anybody hears this or not. I wish that we were warned about some things before the public was, but that's okay. You know, we found out a lot of things at the same time as, as the public with regard to uh, the implementation of high risk sports, but we, you know, we're happy to do what we have, whatever we have to do to keep our students and staff safe uh, to let our athletes play and, and make sure that uh, we all have a great experience with it. I'm looking forward to it. Great, okay, thank you. Uh, next question, is there a timeline for OMS and Harbor Fields High School to return in person full time? And is this decision made by the district or New York State? So um, it's, it's a good question, it's a fair question. I know a lot of schools are grappling with this. Um, you know. As educators, we all want our students uh, back in school, um, certainly as soon as it's safe to do that, right? So I just wanna reiterate that you have, we have to be careful about comparing us to other districts because we do have different facilities. We have different plans in place. One thing I am so proud of is, that, is the plan that we have in place. I feel like if you go back to the summer, uh, even the spring, when we got the community together and we were mapping everything out, we really didn't know how this was all gonna work out. I heard some people comment that schools in general will be closed by October, we all remote again. And here we are. Um, we should be very proud of the work that we did. I believe our model is safe and it's sustainable. Uh, and it's something that I'm extremely proud of. To answer the question, the, the six foot requirement between individuals has not gone away, right? That's a state requirement, State Department of Health guideline. Um, so until that changes, it would be very, very extremely challenging to bring students back. Um, people might refer to our elementary program, but I just wanna remind people that our class size at the elementary level is much smaller than it is at the secondary level. So we do have more bodies and bigger bodies at the secondary level, uh, which does impact any decision that's being made. So, you know, the science behind this, obviously that the spread of the virus is made more possible when you have increased density of people in the room. Um, right now, I'll just, you know, come out and say that the positivity rate in our, our area is certainly too high for us to consider this um, right now. We always want to plan to see, you know, for different contingencies going forward, but you know, we, we saw when we came back from the December break, a true spike 
in the number of cases that we had. And you're going to see tonight we have more cases. Uh, and I'm not, I'm, I'm concerned about, you know, you have coming up, you have Super Bowl, you have February break. Are we going to see a repeat of those? Um, there's discussion in the, in the, in the news about this UK variant and there's other variants that are highly contagious. And we, we just gotta be really careful. Because one thing we, uh, we always have to consider is that, is the contact tracing process. And while I have this topic, I wanna thank our administrators uh, because the contact tracing process, even tonight, I mean, it's, it's a arduous task uh, that our building administrators are doing to make sure that we, if we have a positive case, that we map out where that person was at all hours during that infectious period and be able to identify those people that might be close contacts and make sure that they're quarantined. Um, and it's a, it's a difficult task, but you know, our administrators care so much about our schools, about our students, uh, our community, that you know, we spend nights and weekends doing this. Um, and you know, it, it's, so far it's worked out for us really well. We've had a very good success with it. But the contact tracing process is important to understand because as you increase the density of people in the room, with that, if there's a positive case, you're then quarantining that many more people. So the goal of returning to school would be more in-person learning, right? That would be the goal of it. But right now, in a two week period under the hybrid schedule, you're getting five days of in-person instruction. If we go and start putting people in rooms, we might be under the uh, unfortunate circumstance of having to quarantine large numbers of people so instead of getting five days of in-person learning, now you're getting zero days of in-person learning over that period of time. And it could be frustrating, uh, especially when we have, we're approaching, you know, toward the end of the year with assessments coming up, uh, you know, seniors needing to make graduation requirements and, um, you know, regions exams if they move forward, 338 exams if they move forward, AP exams if they move forward. And these are all things that we have to consider when we're mapping out anything because we don't want to make the quick reaction to get students together but have long-term impact educationally on our students if they're not able to actually participate in in-person learning because of um, the number of cases that we're seeing. So, you know, to, to, to get to the question again, we always look at everything. You know, as I said at the beginning, I'm a long-term planner, I'm a strategic planner, I like making us aware of all different contingencies, mapping out the pros and cons of each and seeing how we can move forward uh, in the most successful way. And that's something with, that we're gonna continue to do with, with this particular question itself. Um, so the quick answer is no, not at the moment, um, but certainly as we move forward, we always do those, you know, those, those analysis. Thank you. Tough to give candid answers, but definitely your honesty is appreciated on all of these. That's all I can do. I mean, you know, I don't know if it was Mark Twain or somebody said, you know, being honest, this is the best thing I can, I can try to do. Absolutely. Um, so I have the pleasure of giving us our last question tonight. Uh, number eight is, are there plans to have an in-person kindergarten screening and student orientation this spring? Right. So, um, the short answer to that is, you know, the uh, kindergarten screening, we're going to push uh, to, you know, to the spring. Uh, we are going to be doing screenings by appointment only. Uh, of course, adhering to social distancing guidelines. Um, and then the orientation program itself, we're going to have components that are virtual, but we're also going to be looking to bring students in and have uh, some in-person components of that. That might occur, let's say, in the summer months. Uh, as opposed to in the spring. Um, but we are looking forward to having our future uh, kindergartners come in and get a feel for Washington Drive and make sure that they feel at home here at Harbor Fields because uh, they're the, you know, they're the future of our organization and we want to make sure that they're successful. So we're going to make sure we do everything possible to make sure that they're in and comfortable and ready to go in September. Great. Okay, thank you. Was, this, this was good. This was really great. We appreciate it so much. Dr. Manning, thank you for joining us tonight. Mrs. Fallon, Ms. Donnelly, Ms. Rayner, um, we appreciate your time. 
We want to thank all of our community members who joined us this evening. Um, of course, all of our PTA units and their members too. And Natalie and I want to thank um, our council board members as well. Um, we know they're we know they're listening, and we appreciate all their support too. Um, as we as we work on all of our council things that we have coming up. So um, just want to thank everyone again. March 2nd will be our next one. Um, we will work with the units on uh, them reaching out to their PTA members to secure questions. Um, like we mentioned before, just, just want to ensure that we have a variety of topics each time. Um, I think tonight was great. We addressed district-wide as well as, as building specific questions. Um, so we want to thank everyone for their time tonight. And as always, if you have additional questions that weren't addressed and you're anxious to get those answers, um, Dr. Manning and his cabinet are always willing to answer those. Um, so please reach out to the district office. And if you have questions too that you wanted to share with your, your PTA units, you can do that as well. Right. Thank you so much, uh, everybody. I know how... Uh, much time you put into this. So I really do appreciate it. Thank you to everybody. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the remainder of your week. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.